Hello. Welcome to this walkthrough of the free response questions and the rubric for the AP Computer Science Principles Create task. This video is geared towards users of the Code.org App Lab environment, but you can use it with any programming language. In this video, you will learn about the different portions of the written response, the scoring criteria from the rubric, and some pointers to avoid common mistakes. Afterward, you'll get a link to more resources to help you understand the rubric and general requirements. First, some general information about the written response. For all parts in 3A through 3D, the combined total must not exceed 750 words. The program code is not included in that word count. Collaboration is not allowed on the written response. You can get instructions for submitting your written responses on the AP Computer Science Principles exam page, which you can log into through AP Central. We'll start by looking at prompt 3A and row one of the rubric. If you want to read the specific decision rules, check out the link to the rubric in resource number 10 in the video description. You need two things to meet the requirements for row one of the rubric. The video needs to show specific behaviors of your program and you need to fill out the written response. The video must demonstrate input, program functionality, and output. The input is what information the user gives to the computer. That will most likely be either clicking on objects in the program or typing things into the program. Program functionality is what the program does. Output is the information the program gives back to the user. That could be text displayed on the screen, it could be sound or video giving information back to the user. 3A Part 1 of the written response should describe the program's overall purpose. 3A Part 2 describes the program functionality demonstrated in the video. These prompts seem similar, but you must distinguish between the overall purpose and the functionality. The overall purpose is what you are trying to accomplish by writing the program. The functionality is what actually happens in the video that allows the program to work towards achieving that goal. Maybe I wrote a program to help people learn about flags from different countries. That would be my overall purpose for the program. The functionality is the app displays a country name and then a picture of four different flags. The user clicks on the correct flag and the program tells them if they are correct or incorrect. The quiz functionality works towards the purpose of helping the user learn about flags from different countries. The input for the program is the user clicking on a flag. The output is the program telling the user if they got the question right or wrong. I talk more about 3A parts 1, 2, and 3 in resource number 1 in the video description. The rubric's criteria for the written response is pretty straightforward. Did you describe the overall purpose of the program? Did you describe the functionality of the program? And finally, did you describe the input and output of the program shown in the video? If your program has functionality that's not in the video, you shouldn't be writing about it. Next, let's look at the five prompts for part 3B of the written response. Row 2 and 3 on the rubric correspond with these prompts. 3B asks for two program code segments that you developed while you were working on the project. Any code on the free response portion should be something you or your partner wrote during the create task. To learn more about where and how you can use code written by someone else, check out resource number six in the video description. If you are using AppLab, you will probably use an array type of list. The list has to be used to manage the complexity of the program. You want to make sure while you're writing the program that the list will simplify the program by allowing you to manage the data more easily. All five prompts for 3B should have a total of roughly 200 words. However, that doesn't include the code you copy and paste into the written response. The first program code segment must show how the data was stored in the list. It's not enough to declare a list variable. We need to see how you put the data in the list. You might hard code the data, take the data from the user, or import the data from a column on a table. To learn more about importing a column from a table into a list, check out resource number two in the video description. The second program code segment needs to show the data in the list from part one being used to create new data or the program accessing different elements in the list. You need to be able to explain later how creating or accessing data is working to fulfill the program's purpose. Part 3 asks you to identify the name of the list used in the response. 
When it says name, it means the variable's name. Don't give the name of a table or column from which you got the data. Part 4 asks you to describe what the data contained in the list represents in your program. Maybe Part 3 had a variable called Cubs Baseball Scores that contained all baseball scores for the Cubs. In Part 4, you could say that the list includes all scores for every Cubs game arranged by date. Finally, in Part 5, you explain how the selected list manages complexity in your program code by describing why your program code cannot be written or how it would be written differently if you did not use a list. This is probably the most challenging part of 3B. First, think about what your list holds. I use the example of Cubs baseball scores. Suppose instead of having that data in a list, I needed to store all those scores in individual variables. Having every single score in its own variable would require a tremendous amount of variables, and it would also require me to rewrite the code that processes the list. It's a good exercise to try rewriting your program, and instead of using a list, use individual variables for each element in the list. Also, when answering this, think about what would happen if new data came in. With our example of the baseball scores, the Cubs are always playing new games, so there are always recent scores to add. With a list, you can simply add them to the end and have a longer list. However, if you have a variable for each score, why would it be more difficult to add on new scores? Suppose you do that exercise and realize you can fairly easily write the program without a list, maybe with just two or three variables. In that case, it's probably not a good example of using a list to reduce complexity. Let's look at row two of the rubric. Did your first program code segment show how the data was stored in the list? Did the second code segment show the data being used in a way that helps the program fulfill its purpose? The scores differentiate between a meaningful and a trivial use of a list. In the part three prompt, did you give the variable name for the list? In the part four prompt, did you identify the data in the list and its importance in your program? Now, row three of the rubric. Did your program code segment show the list being used to reduce the program's complexity? Did you completely explain how your program would specifically be written differently or even impossible if you didn't use a list? Now, look at part 3C of the written response and rows 4 and 5 of the rubric. 3C, capture and paste the program code segments you developed during the administration of the task that contains a student-developed procedure that implements an algorithm used in your program and a call to that procedure. The College Board uses the term procedure. If you're using App Lab or JavaScript, you're probably using the term function. For this project, the different terminology is irrelevant. The program code should implement an algorithm, which is a set of steps used to solve a problem. The four parts of the written response for 3C should be approximately 200 words, and again, the program code doesn't count. The two pieces of code can be the same program code from part 3B or they can be different code selections. One difference in 3C is that the code must be an entire procedure. In part 3B, it was optional, but not required to be a complete procedure. The first program code segment must be a student developed procedure that does all three of the following. First, define the procedure's name and return type if necessary. When you create a procedure, you'll name it unless it's an anonymous procedure. It says to include the return type, but in App Lab and JavaScript functions, we don't explicitly name a return type, so you don't have to worry about that. Second, the procedure must have one or more parameters that affect the functionality of the procedure. Different values passed to the parameter should result in different behaviors from the function. You can learn more about parameters in an abstraction in resource number seven in the video description. The third requirement is that the code implements an algorithm that includes sequencing, selection, and iteration. Sequencing is when two or more lines of code execute in order. Selection is when a condition, a Boolean expression, is evaluated. Which path the program takes depends on whether the condition evaluates to true or false. Iteration is where you have program code that repeats itself, usually inside a loop. To learn more about sequencing, selection, and iteration, check out resource number eight in the video description. Part two contains another program code segment showing the procedure in part one being called. The procedure in part one will have one or more parameters. So when it is called in part two, the call needs to have one or more arguments.
You can learn about arguments and parameters in resource number seven. For parts three and four, you will write about the code from parts one and two. For three, you describe in general what the identified procedure does and how it contributes to the program's overall functionality. These are two separate requirements, so make sure you address them separately. In part four, you explain in detailed steps how the algorithm implemented in the identified procedure works. Assume you're trying to explain the program to someone who doesn't know much about programming, but could understand it if you explain it to them line by line. Your explanation must be detailed enough for someone else to recreate it. It may be worth coming back to your response to part four on a different day and seeing if you can recreate your algorithm. Now let's look at the rubric. First, row four asks if you have a student developed procedure in part one of 3C and if it has a parameter that affects the functionality. Make sure that the procedure's behavior is modified in a significant and useful way based on the value sent to the parameter. Second, it asks if, in part two of 3C, you have a call to that procedure that passes an appropriate argument. The argument passed will likely be a variable instead of a number or a string literal. Finally, in part three of 3C, it asks you to explain what the procedure does and how it contributes to the program's functionality. If too much of your total program is wrapped up in this one procedure, it can be hard to differentiate the two. You want to have other elements of your program's functionality in other parts of the program. For example, this procedure might process the data, but other procedures might do things like display the data or store user input. Row 5 first evaluates whether the procedure in Part 1 contains sequencing, selection, and iteration. Second, it assesses the explanation of the detailed steps in part four. Remember, the benchmark is whether another programmer could recreate a nearly identical algorithm based only on your description. Part 3D is the final portion of the written response. It has six prompts in three different parts. It should be approximately 200 words in total. Part one of 3D wants us to describe two calls to the procedure identified in the written response 3C1. Let's say my function in 3C1 was something like this. In 3C2, the call to the highest score of the year procedure might look something like this. For 3D1, I can create two hypothetical calls based on hypothetical user input. For example, if the user decided to search for the highest score in 2016 and 1865, the two hypothetical calls would look something like this. The two hypothetical calls must result both in different behavior and different lines of code run in the procedure. It may be that you'll accomplish this using an if-else statement inside the procedure from part three. Just because you pass two different values to the parameter doesn't mean that different lines of code will execute. For example, if I pass the arguments 1865 and 1866, I would probably have the same lines of code execute in the same way because there are no Cub scores from either of those years. You can learn more about this part in resource number one in the video description. In 3D2, you describe what happens in the procedure during your first and second call. You must explain what each call causes the selection statements in the procedure to do and how the selection statements evaluate differently in the two calls. Also, make sure to clarify how each call causes different lines of code to run. The hypothetical calls don't have to be reflective of the data we saw in the video, but they should pass data that could be reasonably sent to that procedure. Finally, for part three of 3D, what is the resulting behavior or data? The results need to be different for the first and second call. Depending on how your program is coded, your procedure might return a single value or a list. Instead of returning data, your procedure might pass the data to another procedure that formats and displays the data. For row six, make sure your response in part 3D describe two separate calls to the same procedure with two different values passed. Make sure you articulated how a different segment of code was executed in each call. Also, make sure you described what conditions were tested by your selection statement. Your selection statement may have been a Boolean expression attached to an if or if else statement. Finally, did you articulate the specific data and or behavior that resulted from each call? Some other useful resources. Citing code for the create task, 
This lets you know how and when you need to cite code, resource number six in the video description. The sample create task explanation and tips, resource number one. The official AP create task rubric. This has the scoring criteria we went over in the video, but it also has some decision rules worth looking at, resource number 10. Finally, the College Board rubric videos, which go over some of the things I talked about in more detail and give examples, resource number 11. To learn more about the Create Task, check out the next video or the full Create Task playlist.